Well, in the wake of the Oberfeld opinion of the Supreme Court, there are several Christian, and I'll put Christian in quotations there, several Christian colleges that have already caved in in order to avoid any potential persecution that might come their way from the sodomites who seem to be in control of our country by and large. They haven't even considered fighting this evil, not even an option on their menu. Instead, they have compliantly changed their policies to comply with and supposedly accommodate, how can you accommodate it, but accommodate sodomite on marriages on their campuses. Baylor University, the largest Baptist uh, university in the land in Texas. Hope College, a uh, reformed Christian church college in Holland, Michigan. Belmont University of Nashville, as well as Notre Dame University. They have all approved benefits to sodomites who claim that they are married. They've already provided provisions for this, and so they are making prostrations, worshiping at the sodomite idols of our day, hoping to avoid persecution against Christians, a persecution that we see rising in our land. By the way, some would object to, being, to using that term sodomite, but I say it is the biblical term used throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, clearly identifying this as God's a con condemnation of it as an abomination. Well, in addition to those colleges caving in, we see uh, school boards and publishing houses already changing their curriculum, changing their curriculum to align with this sodomite propaganda. Recently, CBN News reported what's happening in the Virginia schools in preparation for this fall, and I won't even mention it. It's extremely graphic and horrifying. When children have to sit in schools that advance sodomite propaganda to them, when the media then glorifies sodomy and portrays it as normal and natural and as simply an alternative lifestyle that they are enticed and they are persuaded and they are therefore recruited into this death style for what that's what it is. I appreciate what uh, Justice Scalia said in objection to the decision of the majority. He said, quote, many Americans do not want persons who openly engage in homosexual conduct as their business partners, as scoutmasters for their children, as teachers in their children's school, or as boarders in their home. They view this as protecting themselves and their families from a lifestyle that they believe to be immoral and destructive, end quote. And Justice Scalia is absolutely right. Well, in addition to those tragic developments this week, there were two others that you may be aware of. You know, as most of you now by this point in time, that Planned Parenthood has been exposed as the one who is selling baby body parts after killing these dear unborn children. One of the major leaders sipping wine and eating her lunch without vomiting was describing the procedures they use for doing this, for preserving certain body parts as they murder the babies. And then this week, another video came out that was posted that was equally damning of Planned Parenthood. This barbarism continues at the same time that the Obama administration won a crushing court decision opinion, forcing the little sisters of the poor to participate in providing contraceptives that are against their religious convictions. The leader of those nuns, McGuire, said, we simply cannot choose between our care for the elderly poor and our faith. What's taking place in America is horrific. And the despair in the air of our land is so thick that you can cut it with a knife. What are Christians to do in the midst of this onslaught? Shall we cave in as some are doing? Shall we surrender and do the bidding of those who are demanding this of us? Shall we go into hiding? Shall we raise a white flag of surrender? Indeed, we are beginning to see those responses on the part of many who name the name of Christ, but is that what our Lord and Master would have us to do at this time? Does it matter, in fact, that Jesus Christ is actually King of all kingdoms, that he is Lord of all lords? Does that make a difference? And should the reality that currently, right now, Jesus Christ is seated 
at the throne room of heaven, at the right hand of God the Father, with all authority in heaven and all authority on earth having been granted to him, does that make a difference in how we, as followers of Jesus Christ, should respond? Should we surrender? Should we offer capitulation? Well, the answer, of course, is a resounding no, of course not. Then how can it be that so many so-called Christians in America, so many followers of Christ, are responding in the wrong way? I would contend that it is because they have the wrong view, the worldview of this subject matter called history. And as I shared with the children, many people, when they hear the word history, think of some dusty old books and some things that are irrelevant in a series of facts they have to memorize. Well, that is not true. In fact, it's the exact opposite when we look in God's Word. When we study God's Word and gain a worldview of what the Bible teaches regarding history, we discover that it is very relevant to our day and to our time. And to have a proper biblical worldview of history enables us to face what we are facing in our day. It gives us a proper perspective. In fact, it gives us an accurate framework by which to function. The fact that Christians stand in the history of the church, have stood in the face of onslaughts and persecutions and times of trial and have remained unshakably confident in the Word of God is because they had a biblical worldview of history. They knew the end from the beginning. And I believe that that is what we as Christians need today in our land, a biblical perspective of history so that as we face a rising tide of persecution against Christians, we will understand where we stand and what it is we must do. This morning, I just want to simply impart to you six facts from a biblical perspective of history. And the first one is in the very first chapter of the Bible. So open to Genesis chapter 1. These six elements are critical to have in our minds what we need to face what I call a militant resurgence of paganism, a militant resurgence of paganism that has not been known in this land for over 400 years. And now we are facing it in this land as never before. Look at Genesis 1 and verse 1. Here's the first thing that we need to understand. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The creation is the first fact of history. In fact, history began at this point in time as God created the space-time universe itself out of nothing by the word of his power. This is the beginning point of history, and it speaks a profound message to us. And the message is that God is the one that created all things. Everything in heaven, everything on earth, the entire universe is his creation. That means he created the laws which govern that universe, not just merely the physical laws that we study when we study math and science, but the moral laws of the universe as well. And just as those physical laws of the universe are unchangeable, so his moral law is unchangeable. When he defines marriage as between one man and one woman, that's the definition period, and it does not change, and it cannot be changed. Furthermore, since God created all things, the clear implication is that he owns all things. All the objects in the universe, every star and every planet, and every plant and every animal, and he owns every human being, for he created every human being. Now, whether a person acknowledges that God owns them or not, is their decision, but the fact of the matter is, as a creature created by God, they belong to him. He owns them. Notice in verse 4, because we begin a series of statements, we're going to run through a, a series of verses here. Look at what God says in verse 4. God saw the light, that it was good. Then look at verse 10. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas, and God saw that it was good. Verse 12, and the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind and a tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind and God saw that it was good. Verse 18, 
and the rule over the day, speaking of the moon and the sun, rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness and God saw that it was good. And verse 21, God created great whales and every living creature that moveth which, with which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind and every winged fowl after his kind and God saw that it was good. So you begin to get a pattern here? Everything that God created, he had an objective standard by which he evaluated everything he created and he pronounced everything he made as good, good, good. And then go on to verse 25. God made the beasts of the earth after his kind, the cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And then the final pronouncement in verse 31. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. The entire universe, everything God created was without sin, it was perfect, it was good, and indeed, it was very good. This is the first fact that we must have to have a biblical understanding of history. It began with God creating everything in the universe and creating it perfect, creating it good. Let's note verses 26, 27, and 8 because that directly relates to us as those created by God, mankind. Look at what he says in verse uh, 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 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Only man, of all that God created, only mankind was made in God's image. Only man bore the image of God and God gave us a mandate as human beings that we were to take dominion over the world that he had created. That is our purpose for being in this world. God made every man in his image and therefore God has written his law, Romans 2, 14 and 15 won't turn there, but it tells us God has written his law on the heart of every human being. Even if a person ignores it, even if a person stamps upon it and rejects it, they know the law of God because they were made in the image of God with God's law written on their heart. But we know that that's the beginning of the story. The tragedy just turned to chapter 3, took place in the fall. The creation is the first fact we must know. The fall is the second fact we must know that Satan came and tempted Eve who took the fruit which God had forbidden, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and she ate, and she gave to her husband, and he ate, and man fell, man became depraved. But the dominion mandate God had given had not changed. It was not abolished. It was not rescinded. His command to take dominion still remained. Now, there were consequences to the fall, consequences that would mean taking dominion was that much more difficult. Look at chapter 3 and verse 17. This is what God said. He said unto Adam, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field in the sweat of thy face. Shalt thou eat bread till thou shalt return unto the ground. For out of it thou wast taken, for dust thou art, and to dust thou shalt return. So all of a sudden now taking dominion is not going to be easy. It's going to be difficult. It's going to involve toil and sweat and the earth is not going to yield up its fruit easily. It's going to produce thorns and thistles. There was a curse because of the fall, a curse that affected all mankind. Indeed, it affected the woman very directly as well. Look at what God had to say uh, uh, to the woman next in verse 16, if you go backwards here. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow shalt thou bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband that he shall rule over thee. And so the effects of the fall brought a curse upon her in her life, in her mission in this world, and effects upon their marriage relationship. Furthermore, the effects extended to all human beings. Look back at verse 15. We're kind of going backwards here because here's what God said to Satan who had possessed and indwelt the serpent at this point. 
Notice what he said, and I will put enmity, verse 15, between thee, that is Satan, and the woman, between thy seed, Satan's seed, and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. What we see as a result of the effects of the fall is that there's a division in mankind between the followers of the one true God, those who seek to follow in obedience to him, and those who are opposed to the one true God, opposed to his sovereign rulership. These are the seed of Satan. And mankind is divided into these two camps, the covenant keepers of the sovereign kingdom of God and the covenant breakers of the conspiratorial kingdom of the prince of darkness. And history really is a display of this battle between these two kingdoms throughout the, the, every, every, part of, uh, every part of the world up until the end of time. So the conflict that began in Genesis 3 goes to the very end of time that we'll see at the end of Revelation. It's interesting how Scripture describes Satan and what his work is. Let me just read to you from Isaiah 14 and verse 12 where it says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? That last phrase there tells us what Satan is always about. When any nation becomes strong, and by the way, a nation becomes strong by following God's law, by establishing righteousness and justice in that land, they become strong. They become powerful. But once a nation becomes powerful, Satan weakens such nations. He undermines the moral foundation of those nations. He introduces wicked immorality and seeks to bring the nation down. He weakens every nation that he can influence. And certainly we see that has happened in our own nation. And that's his procedure with any nation. We see from Genesis 3. The depravity of man begins to expand rapidly. In chapter 4, we read the first murder takes place, Cain killing his brother Abel. And the wickedness just increases from chapter 3 into 4 and to 5. And look at chapter 6. Chapter 6 and verse 6. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. There was only one man and his family, eight souls, Noah, his wife, his three sons and their wives, only eight souls that God determined to preserve as he was going to wipe out the rest of mankind in a worldwide flood. And this is the third fact we must know in a biblical view of history, that judgment comes upon wickedness. God does not tolerate wickedness forever. It reaches a point. It reaches a high tide. It reaches a point which God says, enough, no more will be tolerated. And God destroyed the entire world except Noah and his family. The flood was absolutely necessary for a restart to take place. It was a hard reset. Eliminate all the wicked people on the planet, all the covenant breakers, all the seed of Satan who are following Satan. Eliminate them from the world and start over with just eight people. You know, I find it extremely ironic today that the sodomite movement has adopted as their flag of allegiance the rainbow flag. Do you know where that rainbow comes from? Just turn, if you would, to chapter 9 here, Genesis chapter 9. And verse 11, as they came off from the ark, God made promises to Noah and to his family. And look at verse 11, Genesis 9 and verse 11. God said, and I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. And neither shall there be uh, any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow, that's the rainbow, I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And so falsely it appears to me that the sodomites have adopted the rainbow flag because they're saying, look, God promised that he's never going to judge us. He's never going to punish the earth. He's never going to destroy the earth like he did in the flood that killed everybody but Noah and his family. But is that what these verses say? Look back at verse 11 closely. Notice what it says there. Neither shall all flesh be cut off anymore by the waters of a flood. 
God never said he wouldn't bring judgment upon the earth ever. He just said he would not do it again by means of the flood of waters as he did it in the days of Noah. That worldwide flood was to be a reminder to all mankind of the end that wickedness brings. Indeed, God's word is very specific. It's not a flood next time. The worldwide judgment will not be a flood. Instead, it will be a fire. Turn, if you would, to the New Testament, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7. Look how specific the word of God is. Not a flood, but a fire. But the heavens... 2 Peter 3, 7. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Then skip on down to verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also in the works that are therein shall be burned up. Wow. When you read this, you realize this is an even more complete destruction than the flood that destroyed everyone on planet earth except Noah and his family. Here you have something, the periodic table. All the elements of the periodic table will melt. So helium and hydrogen, the beginning of the period, all those elements, the very atomic elements of the universe are going to blow up. It's like a gigantic atomic explosion where every single atom in the universe explodes in a great fire of destruction. This whole entire universe is going to be gone. God's judgment is coming. And we live between the two great judgments. We live between the flood and the fire. Yes, the flood is past. The rainbow should remind us every time we see it of God's judgment and that we are now under his mercy for the time being until the next judgment comes of the fire, a terrible judgment that will destroy everything and consume all things. So I'm puzzled that they don't understand. Their rainbow flag should point them to the fact that we are between the judgment of the flood and the coming judgment of the fire. Well, in a sense, these first three points of a biblical worldview of history, creation, the fall, and judgment, are the bad news, that we are under God's judgment. The good news is the next three elements. First is the redemption purchased by Jesus Christ. This was the promise spoken of all the way back there in the Garden of Eden in, in chapter 3 that, yes, there would be an enmity between Satan, his seed, and the woman's seed, but the seed of the woman, Jesus Christ, would ultimately crush the head of of the serpent, crush the head of Satan. That was accomplished by the life and death and burial and resurrection and ascension of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God accomplished through Jesus' time here on earth in those 33 years, God accomplished the work of full and complete redemption. The sins of all mankind were placed on the Lord Jesus Christ as he died upon the cross. And the Father accepted that payment that was made for us by Christ's death on the cross. We know he accepted it because he raised Jesus Christ from the dead and then he ascended him to heaven, set Jesus Christ at the right hand of God the Father in the throne room of heaven. The redemption was complete, entire, and full. And Jesus now stands in the position of all authority. Matthew 28, 18 tells us that Jesus Christ was given by God the Father all authority in heaven and on earth. He is the one to whom all authority has been given. And this brings us quickly to the, the, the fifth element, the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. The kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, we must understand, is the flow of what God is unveil unveiling in history of time. That kingdom began, Mark chapter 1 and verse 15, with the preaching of our Lord Jesus Christ. Mark 1 and 15 records the very first words that Jesus proclaimed in his preaching ministry there uh, in Mark 1, 15. He began his ministry by saying this, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Jesus proclaimed this message. That the kingdom of God is not something in the future. The kingdom of God is not something we wait for. The kingdom of God began at the preaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. It began right then and there. And it expands, exponentially expands greater and greater and greater. 
It, be, it be expands first by coming into the hearts of individuals who place their faith in Jesus Christ. And it, I won't have you turn there, but Luke 17, 21, Jesus says, the kingdom of God is not here or there. Behold, the kingdom of God is within you. So the rulership of Christ, the kingdom of Christ begins when a person places their faith in Jesus Christ. They come into his kingdom because they, as subjects of the king, begin to walk and live their lives in obedience to the king. That's what it means to be in the kingdom. They seek to walk in obedience to Christ out of love for him. So if there is ever a conflict between the rulers of this world and what Jesus Christ commands, what do those do who are true disciples of Jesus Christ? For them, there's never a question of allegiance where their loyalty lies. There is never a question whom they will fully obey because no human authority is of any validity whatsoever when it contradicts or when it demands we disobey Jesus Christ. It has no authority whatsoever to say so. The kingdom of God begins within the hearts of individuals who place their faith in Jesus Christ. But we need to understand it doesn't just stay there. It just isn't personal piety that individuals come into the kingdom. The kingdom of Jesus Christ advances and overtakes the entire world. Turn, if you would, to Colossians in the New Testament. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 20, where the apostle Paul teaching the Colossians this fact that they need to understand the kingdom ultimately brings all things under and into submission to Jesus Christ. Notice what he says in Colossians 1.20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Ultimately, the kingdom of God is going to so radically transform and reconcile everything, it doesn't say every person here, but everything that all things are reconciled under the kingship of Jesus Christ as King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, what, but what about the people here? Because it doesn't mention people. Yes, there will be those who remain rebels against Jesus Christ, those who refuse to ever submit to Jesus Christ. And you know what must happen? For the new world to be a pure and righteous place, those people must be locked up forever, that they can never come and pollute and infect and rebel against the king. They will not be permitted to do so. They will be locked away forever, and that is what is just and what is righteous and what must take place for all things to be under Jesus Christ as king of kings and lord of lords. See, that's where the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ is going. The rebels will be locked away forever. You see, a biblical worldview of history helps us understand that the Bible repeatedly declares to us that God is the one who governs in the affairs of men. God is providentially steering the course of history for his purposes to be accomplished. He works out his purposes and he works out his plans in the particular events which appear to us from our perspective appear to be the free actions of individuals or sometimes appear to be just random events that have no rhyme or reason. That's not the case at all. God, through history, is working out his plan for all of it to be accomplished. In fact, neither men nor Satan can ever thwart God's sovereign plan. All events, even if we don't understand them initially, all events that take place in one way or another are working towards accomplishing God's ultimate design. Consider, if you would, Acts chapter 4, if you have your Bible there. Acts chapter 4, verses 27 and 28, Peter is explaining uh, to the religious leaders there about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ because seeing that the Son of God was taken by wicked men and murdered, which is what he was, he was murdered, you would have to say, this is a horrible evil. This is one of the greatest evils that has ever occurred. But notice how it's explained here. Acts 4, 27. For of truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. So from a human perspective, it looked like these human actors were doing what they wanted to do. They wanted to murder Jesus, and they accomplished the murder of Jesus. It looks like a desperate thing. But notice what he goes on to say. For, and he's speaking to God here, for to do whatsoever thy hand, God's hand, and thy counsel, God's counsel, determined before to be done. 
Evil men did what evil men do. They committed murder. But God so superintended those events and what took place that his will was accomplished, that salvation was accomplished, that redemption was complete by the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. So evil people can do all the evil they want, but they can never thwart the plan and the work of God. They freely choose the evil they do. God didn't take away their free will and force them to do anything. They freely chose the evil, which means they are morally accountable for it. But God is the sovereign ruler of all things, used even their free choices of doing evil for accomplishing his ultimate purpose in the work of redemption and salvation. So when we look at history, it's nothing that is impersonal. There is no such thing as fate, no random chance, no unwavering determinism, none of that whatsoever. There is a God who created all things, a God who is governing all things and leading them to accomplish his purposes, which he has already determined. History, then, is actually his story. His story, God's story working out in the world, his plan and his purposes. God has recorded his plan, given it to us here in his word. In the events of time, then, that story, that plan is being worked out. From the events that we read in the Old Testament, from the giving of his law at Mount Sinai, God establishes his covenants with his covenanted people, providing salvation for his covenanted people, and God is moving forward. Nothing can stop it. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 16? Peter had just made the great confession that Jesus was Lord and God, and he said, Peter, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Nothing that Satan can do can stop the work of God. You see, ultimately, Scripture tells us the fulfillment of this is that God will put all things under the feet and will make all enemies of Jesus Christ his footstool. He'll use them as his footstool, as a hassock on which he places his feet. So the biblical worldview understands that history is purposeful. It is moving in a direction. It has an aim given to it by God, an aim and a purpose and an end that cannot ever be thwarted. So history is not As the famous playwright once wrote, a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury signifying nothing. No, it's the exact opposite. It is God accomplishing his purposes. It is a record of God working in space and time, revealing himself, revealing his plan as the sovereign ruler in the affairs of men. And so we look at events that are happening in our own country. And yes, there's much to cause us great concern, but... We know that God is accomplishing his purposes. In fact, when we look at the history of the church, we find that when persecution is rising and persecution is at its height, that's when the church is the strongest. That's when the church grows the most. Do you know in China today, an atheistic communist regime still rules that country and they hate Christianity and they have sought to stamp out Christianity. Mao Zedong was the first one that began a campaign to kill every Christian he could and he killed 80 million. But you know what happened? The church exploded in growth in spite of him killing 80 million. And the church today in China is stronger than ever. Some estimate more than 100 million, several hundred million is one estimate, strong. Believers in the Lord Jesus Christ whose government hates them and wants to kill them, wants to put them in prison and eliminate their worship services and burn their Bibles, and it cannot stop the church of Jesus Christ. It is growing exponentially, and it's strong. It's so strong that China probably one of the most populated Christian countries in the world, in spite of the fact that its government has an official policy of persecuting Christianity. Consider, as was mentioned already, what took place this week. Africa, Sub-Sahara Africa, used to be called the darkest heart of Africa because it was pagan to the core. People worshiped trees and rocks and all kinds of things, and they never worshiped or heard about Jesus Christ. Missionaries went in from England and from our country and began to share the gospel, began to lead people to faith in Jesus Christ. And today, those sub-Saharan African countries are stronger and more Christian than our own country. As was mentioned, 300 churches of Kenya told Obama, shut your mouth. Don't say anything about your filthy theory of sodomy. Well, he wouldn't obey them. But the president basically told him the same thing. Shut your mouth. They are far more Christian than America is. 
They have Christian leaders willing to stand up for the truth and tell wicked Obama, shut your mouth. You look at other countries like Uganda, another African country where the president preaches abstinence from his bully pulpit as president, saying, remain abstinent before marriage. Don't get involved in fornication. Don't get involved in these wicked sins. And after marriage, remain faithful to your spouse. Do not commit adultery. Do not engage in these wicked sins, and you will be blessed. The president of the country preaches that. Sub-Saharan Africa is far more Christian than America. And indeed, we could go elsewhere in the world and see what's happening in South America where the revival's going on there. There, the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ is advancing. Satan is losing ground. We might look at our little patch and say, wait a minute, it looks the other way around. No, Satan is losing ground. The kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ is advancing towards its ultimate end. Turn, if you would, to the end of the Bible, Revelation 19 which tells us the final fact of history we need to know. Yes, we need to understand the creation, the fall, the judgment. Then we need to understand the redemption, the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. But ultimately, we need to keep our eyes fixed on the consummation described in Revelation 19. Revelation 19, verse 11. John says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. When Jesus comes back the second time, he's coming back as a war, a warrior, the leader of a, an army, and he's coming back as judge. He's going to judge the world. He's going to judge every nation. It goes on. His eyes were, like a, were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. That is, he is rulership of all kingdoms. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed in a vesture dipped in blood, referring to his death on the cross, continually reminded that he paid that ultimate, ultimate price. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him on white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Do you know who those people are? It's you and I. The saints of Christ, not in our own righteousness, but clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, following him on white horses as he comes to conquer this world. And he, it says... And, and out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Here is the final end of a biblical worldview of history. Ultimately, God will bring all things in the history of the world to this climax. From which point forward, everything forever will be under the feet, under the dominion, under the command of Jesus Christ. And all his enemies will be his footstool. That means those enemies of Christ today who are trampling down his law in our land and his rule in our country, they are doomed to failure. History is a line going from creation to this consummation. It's not cyclical as some Hindus like to pretend that reincarnation goes round and round and all. No, no, no. History is linear. It's moving in a direction towards this consummation of all things. Some years ago, I led a, a group of patriots to a tour of the Library of Congress down in Washington, D.C. And in that reading room, one of the most beautiful rooms in the Capitol there, there's a series of quotations around the dome of that capital, framed nicely and very visible. And one of those quotations caught my eye. It's from a poem by Alfred Lord Tennyson, his poem In Memoriam, one of the longest works that he wrote, 130 plus stanzas, and he spent more than 17 years writing this poem. And it, he, in it he addresses the Son of God, the one in whom he and all men must place their faith. He states that God made man in his image and he asked God to help him, the poet, make God's will his will. And then the very closing lines of this poem, he says this, one God, and this is what's on the, in, framed in the Library of Congress, one God, one law, one element, and one far off divine event to which the whole creation moves. That far off divine event he's referring to is right here, Revelation 19. The consummation of history, the consummation of all things when Jesus Christ rules absolutely. The purpose of this second advent of Jesus Christ coming is judgment and to make war on every kingdom and every people which oppose his perfect rulership. 
And with a sharp two-edged sword out of his mouth, he will smite the nations who will not submit to him. He will rule them with a rod of iron. He will judge all people. And notice the description here. It's rather graphic description. He will tread the winepress of God's wrath. The picture here is the winepress is actually people. And just as the treaders of grapes, the juice spills out and fills the vat around where those grapes are held So the wrath of God is going to be tread out by Jesus Christ. And so the wicked in our nation that are making these evil things, they're storing up the wrath of God for themselves personally and for our nation corporately. They will be crushed under the feet of Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords. And so wise rulers in this world, in this earth, will pay homage to Jesus Christ, will honor him. They will follow his law. They will walk in his ways in justice and righteousness. It's only the fools who oppose the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, who make unlaw, that's right, unlaw the rule of their lands, who dishonor his holy name and thus bring his sword down upon them, his iron rod of destruction upon them and their country. You see, their judgment is really only a matter of time. The sentence has already been decreed from on high. They cannot escape it. And therefore, if you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, a follower of Jesus Christ, and the enemy has won this small little skirmish in the overall battle of things, why would you ever cave in? Why would you ever surrender? Why would you ever give ground? Why would you go into hiding? Why would you put up a white flag of surrender? Turn, if you would, to Paul's statement in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 31 and following. Because Paul is talking to Christians who are facing pretty severe persecution there in Rome. In Romans chapter 8, verse 31, he says, What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, Who can be against us? Oh, yeah, we got people all against us, but they don't matter. If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God who also maketh intercession for us, who shall separate us from the love of Christ. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. You might think that's a defeatist statement, but notice what he says next. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Look at what Paul and the early church was facing there. They were facing tribulation and distress and persecution and famine and nakedness and peril and sword, in other words, war. And Paul sees all those circumstances in light of Christ's accomplished victory, and he concludes in all these things, in what things? Persecution, distress, famine, and so on. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Not just conquerors, not just victors, but we're more than conquerors conquerors. What a statement of triumph. What a statement of victory for the saints. And so as Christians, especially in times of crisis and persecution, we need to hold fast to the biblical worldview of history, understanding what God is doing, that he has created all things, and he is still Lord of all things that he created. Yes, the fall came and man is depraved, but the dominion, the dominion mandate did not change in spite of the fall. Yes, judgment came against those who rebelled against God, and judgment will always come against those who rebel against God. There are terrible, terrible consequences to rebelling against God. But the good news is that God provided redemption through the work of Jesus Christ for our salvation, and not only our our salvation, ultimately this redemption is going to be the whole universe is redeemed. All things will be under the obedience of Jesus Christ as King of kings and Lord of lords. So in a sense, the victory has already been won. We're just part of the mopping up operation between the victory that was won on the cross and the consummation that Revelation 19 describes describes for us. And so the kingdom of Jesus Christ is not some far-off occurrence that we sit by passively waiting for it to happen. No, rather, we do as Christ did, 
preaching as he did, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And as that preaching goes forward to the ends of the earth, more people and more language are entering into the kingdom. The Revelation 5.9 describes that there will be people from every blood, every kindred, every tongue, and people and nation that are part of that kingdom. Some people from every corner of the earth will be in the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. The kingdom is advancing, and it will ultimately overtake all things. So should we retreat? No way at all. When you read the description in Ephesians 6 of the spiritual armor God has given to us, there's never any protection for your back. Your backside is not protected, and so if you retreat, if you turn around, you have no protection whatsoever. All the armor protects you only if you're moving forward, only if you are in the front. And as disciples, we must not retreat. We must advance. So as our culture grows darker and darker, the brighter our witness will shine in the midst of that darkness. And we are guaranteed victory. So there's no reason to cave in, no reason to surrender. Why compromise the truth to the enemy? Why raise a white flag? Those who do so indicate their own lack of faith. They show that they themselves worship the idols of our day rather than the one true God. For if they worshiped him alone, his word would be more important than the word of wicked rulers. The enemy attacks would not lead them to falter, but rather to strengthen their arms for battle. We must keep before our eyes the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ victorious, the consummation of all things that Christ has already won and that he is now building his kingdom and his kingdom will ultimately prevail. Turn to one last scripture, Luke 21, 25, because the words of Jesus speak to our hearts today, right now, in this time, in this situation. Luke 21, 25, he's talking about the signs at the end, and he says, there will be signs in the sun, Luke 21, 25, signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, that's when you just begin to see the edge of these things. When these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. And so we see these things, we say, look, Jesus told us this would take place. Look up, our redemption draweth nigh. We look forward to the fulfillment, all that God's word has promised. One God, one law, one element, and one far off divine event towards which the whole creation moves. Let's pray. God, our Father, thank you for the precious promises of your word. I pray that you'd keep us each in what may be discouraging circumstances focused on your work and your promises and the victory we have in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior in whose blessed name we pray, amen.